How are you doing everyone? The following video is a video I did for FM Scout and it's about different tactical mistakes you can make and any of you guys that have watched me recently on Twitch you'll know that I made a couple of whoppers myself especially in that 7-0 booming by Juventus so without further ado let's get to this video that I did for FM Scout it's been very nicely received thank you for that and I hope you find some use in it Okay, the counter press obsession. Now, counter press came popular because of a hugely successful gig and press style of play that a lot of people have had. Now, the problem with counter press is that if you don't have a team up to it, it can put your defense under an absolute ton of pressure. So, what is counter press? The game tells you exactly what it is. Players will immediately apply pressure when they lose the ball. So, when they lose the ball, they're going to go hunting the ball, as you can see from the arrows there. So, these boys. When the ball's out of possession, they're going to go hunting it and they're going to leave the position. What that does is the four at the back there are going to be under some big time pressure if these boys don't win it back. It's something to think about, especially when you're playing against a high technical team that can just ping it around you and there'll be so many gaps for them to exploit, you're going to be exposed. What I prefer to do if I'm not one of the elite teams is instead of having counter press on from the start, I'll watch the game and I'll put counter press on at certain points of the game when I think we can exploit it. Now, like I said at the start of this video, I've made these mistakes and very recently, live on Twitch, I learned this bit the hard way. So after trying to take the game to Juventus away with my tiny Palmer team, I soon learned that counter pressing against a team like that away from home was not the way to go. That doesn't mean it's not a great tool, it absolutely is a great tool. Just depending on the type of team you've got and the players and your opposition. Just don't get pigeonholed into using it all the time like a lot of people tend to do right let's move on to the next one the next one is selecting two different positions that are basically doing the same job at the same area of the pitch now this is most common on the flanks and usually with a wing back involved so if you look on my left hand side here i've got a wing back on attack pizzale and i've got a winger on attack Jovino. i see this a hell of a lot especially on teams playing at home totally fine you're going aggressive i totally get it but if you look at it a bit closer you'll see that these boys are just going to get in each other's way and you could probably use the roles a little bit better to show you what i'm talking about have a little look at the player instructions so we've got wing back on attack here now remember a wing back on attack is basically going to want to get up and down but mostly up and being a really attacking outlet on that flank now if you select these player instructions there you'll see he's got dribble more run wide with the ball cross more often cross from the bar line get further forward he's super aggressive down that flank now in front of him you've got a winger on attack super common but i don't really know why people do it look at his player instructions and you'll see what i'm talking about so my winger is there he's on attack let's have a look at his player instructions and there you go dribble more run wide with ball cross more often cross from the bar line get further forward stay wider they're basically doing the same job so you're going to have two players in the same area trying to do the same thing. They're both going to be wanting to get up here, get the ball and whip it in. Both of them. So there's going to be better ways we can utilise this formation. See, more advanced player has got all these other options that he could use. The winger on attack and your wing back on attack are basically doing the same thing, albeit from different starting positions. But for me, far better use of this lad on this side of the pitch would be any of these other roles, allowing the wing back if you're going to use a wing back on attack to supply the width if you are setting your ways and you really want to use a winger as well as a wing back the only thing i would suggest is to select his pis and bang in roam from position that way he's not going to be stuck out here all the time he's going to wander about a bit more and he'll leave a bit more space for your wing back on attack but for me i still would err on the side of changing his role completely Selecting the right player for your corners is vital and too many people get obsessed with trying to get the biggest beam pull, the tallest player they can, thinking he's going to win all the headers. Not so. You need to look at the attributes. They are much more important, in my opinion. I've done a video all about set players further back in the scout playlist. Go and check it out. But basically, don't get obsessed with the height. For example, this fella, Ben Hockenhull. There he is. He's 185 centimetres, which isn't outstandingly tall same height as me it's about six foot not someone you'd necessarily pick out to be your main target at corners but his jumping reach makes up for that with a 15 i'd always look for jumping reach heading and bravery that combination combined for me gives you better results at attacking corners
Those clips there from a season where Ben Hockenhall there scored 15 goals direct from corners. He's not the biggest guy, but you put his attributes together, it works wonders. There's no point in having a seven foot eight guy if his jumping reaches two and he won't get off the floor. If his bravery is low and he won't go in where it hurts, what's the point? Too many team instructions and it kind of goes hand in hand with not putting player instructions on. So if you are someone who likes to use a lot of team instructions, you'll then need to put some extra player instructions on as well. Let me explain. If you look at in possession for this example, I've got quite a few in possession team instructions there, short of passing, play out of defense, and run out of defense. Let's take a run at defense. So I'm asking my players, run at defense instructs players to run at the opposition more than tactics allow. So these lads are gonna be encouraged to run with the ball. Now, some of them aren't gonna be very good at that. Let's pick on my deep line playmaker here. His dribbling level is eight. So I don't necessarily want him taking people on even though I've told the team as a whole to do it. I need to make a choice here. Do I take the run at defense option completely off or do I then pick out players and tell them to ignore the team instruction and dribble less? It's a common mistake. If you leave run at defense on, they're all gonna think, oh, I can have a little go here. My center backs might get a little bit frisky. They might try it. My wing backs who aren't necessarily that good at running with the ball, they'll try it unless I tell them to stop it. So. Just clicking away on team instructions, you've got to be a little bit careful. And if you want to put more team instructions on, have a look at your players and see what you can do to help them out. If you're asking players who can't run at the defense very well to run at the defense, you're asking for a bit of trouble. A good basic rule of thumb is the lower quality your team is, the less team instructions you should perhaps put on and concentrate more on the players themselves. Player traits. Player traits are huge and they can be a massive advantage for you if you take the time to get the players to develop traits that are going to help them. There's loads and loads of examples you can use that are going to increase the ability of your player and in turn help your team. Let's take this example. I've got loads of examples, but let's start with this one. Joshua Coyote. He's a striker, not normally someone you'd think of. Oh, throw-ins. Normally when you see a striker, you think I'll develop his finishing, his movement. But look at his long throws, 17. That's great. But if you don't develop his trait from that, it's still going to be a bit of a loopy throw. You can develop the trait for possesses long flat throw, which is what we did. So let's have a look at his traits. We bought him and he had the typical striker trait of likes to try to beat the offside trap. I saw his long throws were 17. Let's take advantage of that. So we developed it and we increased it to possesses long flat throw. That was a vital bullet and tool in our armory. Now the final point on traits is that when you get a player and he's already got some traits stacked up, it's very easy to rest on your laurels and leave them be. But on some occasions, these traits may not be too beneficial for the player or your team. So you're better off down training them and training them for something else. So we're picking on the deep line playmaker again. Bless his heart, I'm sorry, don't send hate mail, Arno Poimal, if that's how you say it. But he's came with a load of traits. So the tendency is when a player comes with that many traits is you kick back and relax thinking great, he's got traits. But if you look a bit deeper at them, tries killer balls often, likes to switch the ball to wide areas. Now looking at him, his passing and his vision are okay, but they're nothing to do cartwheels about. So they're probably not the best traits that he could have. I might be better off telling him to keep it a bit more simple and rely on other players to try killer balls and switching the ball so they don't give it away as much. Now, one thing to bear in mind with that is the age of the player. If they're a bit older, they're probably less likely to take a trait away or learn one. So target the younger players, get it out of the game before it gets too deep in their psyche. Now, a classic one is this one. It does my head in, this trait. It dives into tackles. I don't like it. I don't really see the benefit of it. So whenever I get one in, I try and take it away from them. So we go up to our training tab, discuss new trait, and we'll go down to our defending. Defending training, there it is. I would like to start coaching Axel to stop throwing himself into tackles. We press that. That sounds suitable. I'll act on it immediately. Get it out of his game and it's gone. Gonna stop giving away free kicks and hopefully penalties. Stupid trait, get rid of it. So to sum up, when you sign a player, have a look at his traits. Even if he's got a load of traits, think to yourself, can you improve them? Can you take some away? If he's got no traits, you've got a blank canvas, a block of clay, get some involved. That's it for today. I hope some of those make sense and ring true. As you saw, I've been making them mistakes as well, so learning from it is the best way to do it.